This Sunday concludes our series looking at some of our favorite hymns. We come this week to Great is Thy Faithfulness. And as we look at the faithfulness of God, we turn to Isaiah chapter 43, starting at the first verse. If you'd like to follow along, it's on page 672 of the Old Testament in your pew Bible. Let us listen together for God's word. But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you. Because you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you, I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west, I will gather you. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the end of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory whom I formed and made. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Loving God, we know that we belong to you. We ask that you would speak to us this morning by the power of your spirit and through your word so that we might continue to grasp what it means that we are yours, what it means that you have called us by name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I believe I've shared this story before. When I was in college, shortly before graduating, I spent about six months working at an office supply store, uh, just a little bit of steady income to help a college student. And uh, one day I was unpacking boxes of pencils and pens and this sort of thing and putting them up into the aisle. And an elderly gentleman who had recently uh, joined the staff there came up to me and he was very, very friendly and we struck up a conversation. And it came out that I was making plans to go to seminary. And so he asked what church I went to. And the next question that he asked me was this, are you faithful? So immediately I start to feel defensive. And, and, and my answer to him was something like, uh, yes, uh, implied, of course, uh, afraid of what he might say if my answer to that question were no. It was clear to me after that conversation as I thought about it that what he meant when he asked me if I was faithful was something along the lines of, do I attend regularly? Am I committed to the church? Am I faithful? Do I go to church faithfully? Often when we think of faithfulness, when we talk of that word faithfulness, we think of it in terms of religious observance. Our faithfulness is our religious observance. Our religiosity, how faithful are we? How often do we go to church? How often do we do good churchy things? That is how we think often of faithfulness. And it's natural for us to place the burden of faithfulness on ourselves. This is the way that humanity has functioned forever. Anthropologists, as they look back over human history and human prehistory, and as they try to understand the beginnings of religion, what they find is, first of all, a sense that there is something beyond ourselves. There is something out there, a deity, a god, a being, a power, something. And then they find the desire to bring that power, that being, that deity, into alignment with our will, with our desires, with our needs. And the mechanism for bringing a deity into line with our needs is faithfulness. Perhaps it's the sacrifice of crops or animals or even in some uh, cases of humans. Perhaps it's, it's rituals, it's dances, it's, it's music, it's art, these different things, uh, seeking an outcome from the deity. Maybe it is to uh, appease an angry God. Maybe it is to uh, seek the blessing of a beneficent God. Maybe it's to uh, get rain to fall, to obtain a, a bumper crop. Whatever the case may be, faithfulness then is designed, it is a tool, it is a tactic, it is intended to get something from this higher power, this being that is outside ourselves. And while the days of sacrifice and rain dances are long behind us, we still think in these terms about faithfulness. 
Perhaps something wonderful happens to us. A great blessing enters our lives and we feel a sense of gratitude to God. And maybe we also feel a sense of indebtedness to God. A need to repay God with faithfulness. However that looks for us. More faithful church attendance. More faithful giving to charity. More faithful volunteering. We feel indebted to God. And we repay that debt through faithfulness. Or turn it the other way around. Perhaps we're trying to preempt that cycle a little bit. Living lives of faithfulness so that God can be in our debt. If we live faithfully enough, good things will happen. If we live lives of dedication and commitment and faithfulness, God will bless us. While this doesn't completely capture how we think of faithfulness, it's hard to deny that we often conceive of it in this way. We are faithful so that God will be faithful to us. We are faithful so that God will be faithful to us. This idea of God is of a God who can act. A God who can act at any point, at any time to do anything. A God who can act but must choose to act. And so sometimes we take it upon ourselves to try to influence God, to act in a way that might be beneficial to us. And here's where this idea starts to break down. My faithfulness, when my faithfulness doesn't translate into blessing. When I live a life of commitment and dedication and service and the blessings never come. Or perhaps when God's blessing is poured out on those who are not so faithful. In either case, God is not sticking to the arrangement. God is not holding up His end of the bargain. We feel like Job. We wonder what we have done to deserve the bad things that have happened to us. Or perhaps instead of even wondering, we simply give up on God altogether, recognizing that religion doesn't deliver what it promises. This arrangement with God is not panning out the way that we expected it to. God is not delivering on what God has promised. This mentality is present in Scripture. In some ways, it is the defining mentality of the people of Israel. Very early on, they understand their covenant with God to be based upon their faithfulness. God makes an arrangement with Israel. God makes a deal, a contract, a covenant to be their God. They will be God's people. And God will bless them if they keep the commandments that God gives them. And God will curse them if they don't. This is the whole book of Deuteronomy. Setting it out plain and clear for the people of Israel about to enter the promised land. God says, I'm giving this to you and it's all going to go really well as long as as you keep my commandments. But as we see time pass, we see something different happening in the life of Israel. But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine, because you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. The covenant, as it's presented in Scripture, has a lot of conditions. It has a lot of strings attached. And Israel fails repeatedly. Time and again, Israel fails to keep their end of the bargain. But God never fails. These words of the prophet Isaiah are written to Israel when they are in exile. They've left Jerusalem. They no longer call this promised land Home. They no longer have a temple at which to worship their God. They have nothing. They are in exile. And in exile, God makes this promise to them. I've called you by name. You are mine. In exile. We tend to think of faithfulness as an equation. This is how it's set up in, in the Old Testament. This idea of blessings and curses. If you do this, you're blessed. If you do this, you're cursed. We can fast forward that into, into the 21st century. When we think of our faithfulness ought to get us something. We are on one side of the equation. God is on the other. And we're really good at balancing that out and figuring out what that requires of God and what we can expect of God. The trouble is, God is not very good at math. We are really good at math. We're really good at the calculations. We're really good at evening things out, making sure it's fair and balanced. And God is not. This passage from Isaiah is the starting point 
of faith. It is the foundation of faith. The foundation of faithfulness. It communicates to us God's deep devotion to Israel. And of course, God's deep devotion to us. To all of God's children. All belief, all faith, all faithfulness must be built upon that assumption. Namely, the assumption that God is faithful. The assumption that God is faithful. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. God is with us in the flood, in the fire. Our faithfulness, human faithfulness, is not religious observance. It's not worship attendance. It's not the statement, the amount on our statement of charitable giving at the end of the year. Our faithfulness is measured by our trust in God's faithfulness. To what extent do we believe God to be faithful? How faithful do we believe God to be? That is the measure of our own faithfulness. In the book of Hebrews, the author lifts up the example of Abraham. Abraham believed God to be faithful. And he went to the promised land and he got there and he realized it wasn't his yet, but he lived there anyways. He lived there as a foreigner in tents. God's promise had not been fulfilled, but Abram lived as if it already had. Abram lived as if God's faithfulness had already made the promise come to be. Jesus came, He lived, He taught, He angered, He challenged. Jesus did all of this to communicate the message of God's love, the message of God's kingdom, to demonstrate to the people a new reality that He was ushering in, this reality of God that was going to take over the world and turn the world upside down. And Jesus was so committed to the faithfulness of God Jesus was so committed to God ultimately finishing this work, fulfilling this promise, that Jesus found Himself on the cross, crying out to God, why have you forsaken me? That is faithfulness. Our faithfulness is not measured by our religiosity, our religious observance. It's measured by our trust in God's faithfulness. If we believe God to be faithful, trusting that God will stop at nothing to see love overcome hate, peace overcome violence, and justice overcome injustice, then we let that trust shape the way we live. That is our faithfulness. When everything hangs on human faithfulness, when we put all the weight on our own faithfulness, we end up with the God who can act but must be persuaded, must choose to act, But when everything hangs on God's faithfulness, we end up with a God who calls us by name. When it's about our faithfulness, we worry about influencing God's action. When it's about God's, we belong, body and soul, to God who made us. When it's about our faithfulness, we blame God when things don't go our way. Or we congratulate ourselves when things do go our way. But when it's about God's faithfulness, God is with us in the flood, and we are not overwhelmed. When it's about our faithfulness, we give up on God when the equation doesn't balance. But when it's about God's faithfulness, God is with us in the fire, and we are not consumed. With a little bit of time, a few years to reflect on it, a little bit more maturity, I think back on that question that I was asked at uh, the office depot. And I think I might go back, and instead of saying yes when he asked me if I was faithful, I would say no, not really. But God is. God is faithful in the flood. God is faithful in the fire. God is faithful no matter what comes our way. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me.